Let me know if you can see my screen, everybody. I can see it. Yes, yes. I can see it. Perfect. Sure. Hello, everyone. We have just concluded the ISACA part. Um, consider the ISACA part just introducing you to risk management, right? Not necessarily exposing you to the implementation of how to do it, right? Because right now, um, we touch on IT risk identification, assessment, whatsoever. Yeah, we had these nice stories of gas tank and whatsoever, but it doesn't really get your hands dirty on like, how do you do it? And uh, basically, I guess that is a tear school, right? That's why they say school is camp, because uh, it's camp, because <laughs> it doesn't teach you implementation, it only exposes you to the theoretical part. So on this part, we are going to actually do it, right? Starting from that identification and whatsoever, and we are going to take the approach of how the US government does it, mostly on the civilian side, and a little bit of FedRAMP, right? Don't worry if these words are throwing you up. We are going to now touch high level on just introducing the US government cybersecurity frameworks that are quite a lot, but I kind of just touch upon them in high level, right? Okay, so uh, let's get into it. So the landscape. You will, uh oh, what kind of slide did I put together? I didn't know it's coming up like this. Okay, give me a second. Great, I think I got everything. So, starting with this, as we mentioned beginning of the class, day one or day two or whatever it is, we kind of introduced this where there was a hierarchy of either policy, regulations, baselines, whatsoever. So, NIST, and actually, you know what, let me cover the next slide. It might provide clarity, then we go back. Okay, great. So there was a law that was passed called the FISMA law, right? All the way back in 2002, and then it got modernized in 2014, and now there is another one that might be coming up. It was a law, right, that was passed, an act that was passed Initially, it was called the Federal Information System Management Act, and then it became Modernization Act. Part of that modernization that happened when Obama signed it in 2014 was to also require modernization of all federal systems. Okay, now federal systems, but that's why lately you keep hearing the word modernization, modernization. One of the modernization requirements is to move to cloud, right? This applies to civilian. So you hear the health sector, IRS, all of these civilian side, right? The non-sensitive sides of the government. But then NEST, which is an organization. NEST is not a control. NEST is an organization, National Institute of Standard and uh, and what? Technology? No. I yeah, can't remember. Technology. Okay, and technology. They yes. were yeah, they were tasked to identify and work on how to implement FISMA, right? They should guide institutions, sorry, they should guide agencies on how to implement FISMA. So then they laid out this first document. This is document zero. If you are trying to look into NIST RMF, look into NIST 800-37. Rev1 laid out steps, in six steps, but then the revision version two came out, I believe December last year, and it laid it out still six steps, but it added another step called step zero, which we are going to touch upon. Okay, I will go back a little bit. As I mentioned earlier, on that NIST framework and whatsoever, and now everybody understand this, right? NIST came out with these controls which you will keep hearing everybody say NIST 800-53 controls. We just touch upon this, like we have REV4 and REV5 just came out. I saw Ron Ross literally posted it, uh, or, uh, made a post on LinkedIn, I think was it last week or so it came out or two weeks ago. Right. So this class we're still focused on REV4 as I was mentioning earlier, we were just during the break, I'm even yet to actually look at that gap between this and this. So this is it, right? Initially, it is completely focused on agencies, federal agencies. 
practices, right? To implement. But then you keep hearing of these different um, things like FedRAM, whatsoever, and you're like, what the heck is this? Sorry, everybody, it seems like my computer is choosing to misbehave over here, I'm trying to move some few things, but it's, all right. So everybody is saying FedRAM, 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 and people are asking, what the heck is FedRAM, right? And then you start hearing the uh, DOD, SRG, or whatsoever. So going all the way back to the top, just like we have this nest, there are other regulations. This is not the only one applicable, but some of them, this is the one that applies to all federal agencies when it comes to information systems. But we have one like FAR that focus entirely on federal acquisitions, right? So anything the government is trying to get uh, from either contractors, supply chain, whatsoever, um, all contractors that are providing acquisition services, I guess, purchase and whatsoever, there are 15 controls that were identified as part of the FAR, Federal Acquisition Regulation, that the contractors must comply with. There are five, 15 controls, um, you can look them up, but I think, um, not even I think, some of them are focused on authorized users, information types, verifying external information systems, and all of those things, right? Then we have like other ones, like say within FBI, limited to only FBI, there is the um, CGIS, which is the Criminal Justice Information Service. There are also 130 controls that are focused on, first and first, FBI is within the Justice Department. So that gives the law enforcement organizations as well as kind of criminal justice agencies access to criminal justice information. If you want to look into this history, go back all the way to post-20, um, uh, post uh, September 11th, when uh, the Patriot Act and things like that were passed for information sharing or whatsoever. All tied to that. Um, then we have DFAS. I think DFAS is what is being replaced now with uh, CMMC or something like that, but it's more focused on um, protecting control on classified information as well. DOD has adopted um, that as well, DFAS around um, all contractors are required as well, but it's going to, I'm not sure if DFAS meant, to, if CMMC is meant to substitute DFAS or not, but it's just focused as well on the DOD side of things. It is focused on those DOD contractors and it requires all DOD suppliers, including the ones that supply commercial items to really be in compliance. It has also 140 controls. So we now also touch upon the NIST. Then you will keep hearing FedRAMP. So, FedRAM is another dedicated agency that is within GSA and they have controls as well. The controls are coming entirely from the NIST controls, then they added additional controls, but they are entirely cloud service provider focused. This is a little nuance that people are, oh, thanks Jonathan. So DFAS are, so D Department of State owns DFAS or Department of State enforces DFAS? Jonathan, please uh, add to that. They go hand in hand with the DOD, but it's uh, what actually tracks the international. Oh, so oh, yeah. the department tracks the international side, like around yeah. item? Okay. Correct. Great. So um, back to, by the way, thank you for that. So for the FedRAM side, the CSP focused only cloud service providers. So let's take Azure, GCP, let's take uh, AWS, but they are not only cloud service providers, like even a government agency can be a cloud service provider like login.gov. It's basically the IAM solution for the .gov site. It's a service, a SaaS service, any SaaS product, Dropbox, Box, um, Zoom is also a SaaS product. Uh, all of these that are serving the government, they are considered cloud service providers. FedRAM regulates them, not necessarily directly within NIST, because NIST does not enforce it or even oversee it. It passes the implementation and oversight to the, the specific agencies. But because cloud service providers are not government institutions, FedRAM oversees them. All cloud service providers that are serving the government side, civilian side, must be in compliance with FedRAM requirements. Now, a small misconception that happens lately a lot is 
federal agencies, most of them, you go in there, but because they are now modernizing, they keep assuming that they have to satisfy federal. No, they still have to satisfy FISMA, not federal compliance. Federal is focused on the providers, not the federal agencies themselves. They are consumers. Consumers do not need to comply with um, federal controls. But you go into these agencies, you see them using federal templates. You see them whatsoever. And guess what? The templates are actually tailored for cloud service providers. So it provides some confusions sometimes, especially around inheritance and whatsoever. Now, FedRAM and Tele is focused on the civilian side, but for the DOD, there is also the cloud computing SRG, right? Which DISA within DOD see oversees that. These are not the DOD specific controls. They are for cloud service providers. Similar to how FedRAM is for civilians, this DOD SRG is completely CSP focused. And it is overseen by DISA, meaning be it, uh, you keep hearing of uh, AWS Gov Cloud, you will hear of um, Microsoft Azure Gov, all of these that are serving the government side, they need to be in compliance with this. One of those requirements from either both FedRAM and DOD uh, SRGs is actually to have a dedicated data center for, um, for government data, right? Meaning. Hello. I think we, we lost you back. I think there. we lost him. Yeah, I think we lost him. So yeah, what I was seeing is, uh, did you hear when I was talking about the physical separation? No. No. So where did we stop? His mom? Can everybody keep going? Does one person let me know? Can everybody keep on me? Thank you. Um, just let me know over chat if you heard when I was talking about FedRAM only serving the civilian side. Okay, I will take it. Yeah, we heard the civilian side stuff about FedRAM. All right, thank you very much. So yeah, based on that, FedRAM is only meant to serve cloud service provider, but only from civilian consumers. DISA within DOD have the cloud computing SRG that is serving the DOD community, right? So FedRAM does do not oversee these controls, even though DISA and FedRAM, honestly, they work hand in hand very closely, but DISA is responsible for that oversight. And beyond that, unlike how so I was talking about earlier how a lot of federal agencies keep implementing FedRAM controls using FedRAM templates whatsoever, even though they are the consumers and FedRAM is only tailored for providers, right? Not necessarily the consumers. As such, still FedRAM agencies should be complying with FISMA around these controls, but some of them keep looking into FedRAM templates using FedRAM resources. And that is sometimes where the little confusion comes into the picture because these templates are tailored for cloud service providers, not the federal agencies. So you look at like the inheritance or whatsoever, they are completely different. So, so it's the service providers who are getting FedRAMP certified, not the agencies, right? Yes, but an agency also, if it took the position of becoming a provider, right. It, have to get FedRAM. An example is login.gov. Like I can't remember who owned, I think GSE, yeah. GSE owns login.gov and they had to get it FedRAM because it's a provider and it's a SaaS product. Being a cloud service provider, Zoom is a cloud service provider. Um, uh, Dropbox is a cloud service provider. Box is a cloud service provider. Google Drive, Microsoft Office. It's beyond just the Azure environment as well as the um, uh, AWS. Office 365. Right? But little details. Login.gov, they are allowing other agencies 
authenticate using their service. So in that capacity, they are a service. But can everybody please go on mute? Um, but when an agency is only serving as a consumer, they don't need to look into federal templates or federal controls. They still need to be in compliance with FISMA. However, most of these agencies, even though they're, it's their internal services, they keep looking at FedRAM documentation. But FedRAM documentations are completely tailored for CSPs. Similar to how that is, FedRAM is entirely civilian. For the defense side, we have DISA, looking at the cloud SRG, right? They have the cloud SRG. Now, it's very similar to um, DISA and FedRAM. They collaborate a lot, but still, DISA oversees that. Now, any service provider must be in compliance with FedRAM and the actually FedRAM will oversee things. They have to meet FedRAM uh, requirements. That is one little difference. NIST is not tasked to provide oversight. As such, NIST pass that responsibility to the agencies themselves. So you find the agencies are responsible for ensuring the compliance. NIST doesn't come in to check, NIST doesn't work with three PAOs, NIST just write the documentations and provide the guidelines and according to the OMB documentations as well as FISMA, agencies are responsible for that, right? So however, GAO, the audit arm of the government have include ensuring FISMA compliance into their scope. As such, when they come to look at your budgeting and everything beyond just this compliance, they also look at FISMA compliance. All right, now FedRAM is focused on that, we touch upon this, but then also I was saying like, part of the requirement for these is like for the cloud service provider is actually to have a completely separate isolated data center where I was cracking a joke, I think I, I lost everybody at the time, but like um, Fatty's Cupcake is commercial, so it cannot be in the same data center as the government, right? But even beyond that, there are levels to it. Like you will have, say, let's use this, um, the DOD SRG. You have like level IL2, you have IL4, you have like IL5, or within FedRAM you have um, the low, moderate, and high. Either way from FedRAM requirement, all of these can be in the same data center, right? But when you look at it from the DOD SRG requirement, IL2, 4, and 5, they are all considered unclassified, so they can be in the same data center. But anything that gets into that IL6, or maybe I will say IL5 plus overlays, start getting into that com um, sensitive part, because IL6 can take up to a secret, clear, uh, secret data, it requires its own dedicated data center one of the requirements is to actually make sure the identity of the data center is completely isolated. So yeah, we do know like there is AWS Gov Cloud, we know about Azure Gov, we might know they are in Manassas, Ashburn, you can even point it out, but you are not knowing where the IL-6 data centers or the IL-5 uh, plus data centers are. One of the requirements, right? Because they carry heavy sensitive information. No. Professor, I have a question on how the, uh, and I put it in the chat, how the DISA uh, STIGs fit into this hierarchy of, uh, of if you will, uh, reference standards and uh, compliances. Very good question. DISA STIGs are technology specific, right? Where it's just a checklist of initially around VMs, operating system or so, but it has expanded, but they are completely technical controls that are a system must have. An example is DOD does not use commercial TLS certificates. DOD have their own dedicated um, uh, public key, PKIs, right? If you have any card pave or whatsoever, you can go and download the public keys and the private keys are on the other side, right? So part of STIG requirements is for DOD to, like DOD requires every single machine to use their own DOD certificate. Now it's just part of what we call hardening, but they are completely technology focused. Whereas NIST controls go beyond the technology. It includes operational controls, it includes physical controls. Same thing with the FedRAM controls, including the SRG controls. It includes those physical controls where it will say they'll even 
uh, there is a need for good lightening. 95% of the time, the reason why we are not focused on those PS controls these days, including like the contingency planning controls, CP controls as much, is because we are modernizing. It falls on the cloud provider's responsibility within the data center to provide personal security, right? The PS controls. But the coverage for these, it includes, it's more organizational focus, the entire organization, right? That's why you have what we call the common controls that applies to the entire organization. An example of it is have a policy for like, let's say AC1, that is more focused on that account management and having a policy in place that says, these, like just a policy that sets maybe um, account and password parameters and whatsoever, that should apply to the entire organization. The reason why we don't constantly do them is because when you come to like, you are constantly focusing on your own little project within the organization and it's already been in place and identified for the organization, so you're inheriting them. We will touch a little bit on inheritance when we get to implementation, but that is the difference between these sticks and this. Keep in mind, DISA sticks are government focused. So even federal agencies that are implementing DISA sticks, they cannot use the DOD certificate. So as such, all the DISA sticks reports comes out as a finding because they don't use DOD certificates. Federal agencies are not mandated to use DOD certificates, but DOD must use DOD certificate. The second thing is for the commercial world, because these stakes, we have a saying like, if you ever achieve 100% stake compliance, then your machine is not usable. Um, the another um, stakes that, well, not necessarily stakes, but hardening guidelines that are in place is provided by CIS, the right. Center for Internet Security. They are more commercial focused. So consider them similar to ISACA. All right. Um, so professor, real quick, uh, but but the DISIS things are our base, as you said, in technology to to the NIST controls, right? It's just the standard technical implementation guidance on the NIST frame. Nope. Is that correct? Nope. Within NIST controls, we have one control actually around SI system integrity that requires you to implement state. What we just did is, can everybody please go mute? It's just that sticks in themselves. So within these sticks, these sticks themselves have. Uh, sorry, this when you implement these sticks, they also achieve certain control requirements. Here, let me give you a quick example. Within this stick, there is a password reuse instruction where I will say your password must not be more than three days old. Within, AC, within NIST controls or FedRAM or cloud whatsoever, there's also um, like IA5 control where you are defining your password parameters, where you will say the password length is 15 characters and the password you reuse is only three. It has no relationship with this because this is NIST framework driven, this is compliance, I uh, this is the compliance driven. But since this implementation also achieved this, we might as well have an existing mapping for that. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so I copy what you're telling me. It doesn't relate back to, to NIST, but more to the CNS instruction uh, landscape. No, not really. Why don't we, in the interest of time, Let's take, let's touch upon this after. I think I will provide more clarity if I pull a whiteboard here. But right. there's a mapping for this stick and that. Okay, CNSSI, similar to how we have missed here, focus entirely on this consumer side. Actually, CNSSI, that's the Committee on National um, Security Systems Instru Instruction, whatsoever, 1253, provide a guideline on how to decide the categorization and sensitivity of the, of all national security systems, right? So once we start getting into this in depth, you'll see there's something like the step one, step two around categorization and selecting controls. For the civilian side, the step one and two, and even the step three selecting controls is a bit different with the non-civilian side or the national security systems, which is this. And it has 862 controls only because 
it tends to focus so much more on what we call CCIs. You can find like one single nest control, like let's say AC2 is equivalent to like maybe eight CCIs because CCIs focus on action items and this focus on just the high level controls. So let's say for you to implement AC2, you have to do 15 actions because there's AC21, AC22, AC2A, whatsoever. Whereas CCIs, DOD, based on the culture, based on how meticulous it is and precise and whatsoever, every single control is detailed out as a single action item. Implement this, that's one CCI. Do this, that's another CCI. So a bundle of many CCI can result into this, okay? NISPAM, let's keep that, but it's just the classified controls, right? Guidance on that and whatsoever. If you have access to the RM, uh, if you have access to the RMF Knowledge Center, the KS, go over there and generate the overlays. You will see them. If you don't know what that is, then you don't need to know what NISPOM classified overlays are. Um, if this is entirely chaotic to you, let me even make it more chaotic. Don't worry about that because guess what? We are only looking at this and getting our hands dirty at this. Okay. All right, moving on. Any question on that? Great. So we touch on this, 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 this. Now, NIST provides us with the standards, the guidelines, eh, ignore the baselines, procedures whatsoever. But we have the series of all of these documentation from NIST is what we call the NIST 800 series publications. But we also have additional documentations from NIST that are called the FIPS. What is the difference? The 800-37 disk set the entire tone. The 800 series documentation do this. That is, they present the criteria, right? How uh, system, sorry, system um, criteria for system deployment, architecture, security, and whatsoever. The FIPS provide the standards. Let me give you an example. Example of that. What is an example of a very dumbed down example will be this will say, use an iPhone. That's it. And this will say only iPhone 11 or above is supported. That is, if you ever feel like this is so chaotic for you, focus on the next special pro, uh, publications, provide the criteria use the iPhone. The FIPS publications look into the description and the standards from where it's put in like, it has to be TLS 1.2 or 1.3. This is the type of encryption algorithm we are going to use, all of those things, the granular criteria, right? Okay, now, just a second. We already touched upon what FedRAMP is, right? That is the organization that standardize what? Cloud service providers, this, okay? What Dr. are- Is this the reason why AWS is ahead of the other competitors because they are more mature in the Fed realm? It doesn't no. necessarily mean they are better than the others, but just because of they are more on the DOD side and it started no. earlier? You do know I work for Microsoft. How can you tell me AWS is ahead of everybody? No. Ajo is ahead of everybody. All right, jokes aside. Um, <laughs> no, no, I said it's not one better than the other, but uh, because of you know the, the Gartner report that we yeah. talked about earlier put yeah. AWS a little ahead of the others, not necessarily because it's better than the others, because of the maturity model when going through the Fedram. I, I'm just trying to validate this. No, 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 you're absolutely right. They are, I'll be honest with you, Amazon are the first at everything. They are the first major cloud provider to get FedRAM authorized. They are the first cloud provider to get GSA authorized, IL2, IL4, IL5, IL6. Like right now, Aja has achieved those things, but they are the only two dominant players. And when you look at it in all honesty, when it comes to compliance spaces, well, we have already closed all the compliance because both of them have been authorized now at FedRAM high as well as um, DISA or other DOD impact level um, five plus, right? 
because there's really nothing like six IL six environment. There's only five plus. When you start putting the overlays and it gets to a point where it's now considered a secret system, then you, you are getting into the six. So yeah, AWS was the first to achieve all of this. And that's the absolute truth on why they have so much dominance. And even because they are the first to have the federal authorizations, a lot of federal agencies began using them and they really have a wide scope in the market, including things like having the first HIPAA compliance. But when you look at it on a global scale, like who has the ISO standard? You, who has the PCI DSS uh, standards in place? Who has like the Australian signals in place on whatsoever? Aja is leading, because I'm not gonna say AWS is leader and you don't expect me to sell. I used to be a consultant too. You're not gonna box me. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, going back to Fedram, right? Get a bonus for that. <laughs> um, going back to Fedram, just high level, um, look at it like this, right? We all know cloud computing. If you don't go look it up, this is classes not about cloud computing, but we have the cloud models from infrastructure platform service, right? And then we have the deployment model where you have either a private cloud, public cloud, community cloud, hybrid cloud. A government cloud is more on that community cloud, right? Because it's only for government communities, right? That is where Fedram plays. Fedram is responsible for authorizing all cloud providers that are going to be used by the government. DISA is responsible for authorizing all cloud service providers that are going to be used by the government. But around the DOD space, well, the Intel community do not like they are still agents Let's, let's keep the Intel community because they, unlike the DOD where there's a single umbrella, they are just something else. All right, um, they do, anybody from the IC community knows like there's so much individualistic, individualistic approach to their own processes. So some are looking at this, uh, some are looking at their own internal ways, okay? So again, keep in mind, we're only taking the NIST approach. Earlier I was talking about NIST 800-37, the Rev1 did not have the implement phase. The Rev2, I believe came out December, 2019, when it went live. And that is the one that include the prepare stage. And you will see the reason why we need this important phase. One of my most favorite phases, because when I was a consultant doing all of this work with different agencies, lack of planning is what makes this entire step a nightmare. You begin realizing like, oh, we went to the assessment phase. We haven't even identified who our three PAO is going to be. That is why it's good to have the planning phase. From day one, you know who your three PAO, your auditor, your assessor is going to be. You have identified the authorizing official, all of this. If I'm speaking gibberish, don't worry. I promise you by the end of this phase, when you get your hands dirty, either you like it or not, you will kind of understand what an AO means. All right, I feel uh, I feel more for Dave though. Say like he took the class and now he's here again, feeling it all over again. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> all right, um, any question on this page before I move to the next? Awesome. So tools that are being used. Templates, obviously, because there are so many documentations from the SSP whatsoever. Most civilian agencies, they have their own customized templates, but that's what I was saying earlier that you see a lot of them using Fedram templates, which they sh really shouldn't be using. But at least also on the DOD side, I wouldn't say there is a standardized template, but there are standardized um, terminologies around like it has to be CCI, like you can go to RMFKS to download all of those applicable controls and whatsoever. Don't worry, we'll get to it. What are the formats that we are processing things? We have like Word documents, the ARF, that's the asset reporting format. I think we are getting rid of it now. The open vulnerability assessment language. OSCAL is a new initiative. I really, really love OSCAL. I'm working closely as well, actually part of job to with FedRAM and GSA, but the goal is to standardize the entire way we are delivering this. Unfortunately, we are still heavily focused on FedRAM and DISA not necessarily under consumers from like government agencies, but I believe we'll cross there. Dashboard, how do we approach things on whatsoever? These are just some random tools that are there. There are a lot of them out there, 
Tableau is a tool and service now. They are used for dashboarding and ticketing, especially service now ticketing. You come to the technical implementation. So you have your operating system. How do you implement the controls? Manually, using by using as a security engineer. Uh, I did that, it was a pain. And then I started writing my own PowerShell scripts to kind of automate Windows at the time. And then like with at least Linux, it's kind of easier because whatsoever, but then especially with like the PowerShell scripts, you are just one Microsoft. Yeah, I know I'm with Microsoft, but I'm gonna say it's bad. You automate your thing with just like your little PowerShell script so that it deploys across and then Windows will just send out their update and it just messes up everything, right? So another thing to pay attention to. Um, I, I'm, I'm confused by your comment, Professor. Are you saying that, that the use of PowerShell scripts is counterproductive or productive? I'm not saying it's counterproductive, but I'm, not say, I'm saying it's not a long-term thing. Let me give you an example. When I was on using a lot of RHEL and CentOS, I can have my scripts just like within Windows system, you are trying to configure say password parameters on a global scale within Windows. So you are not going to do it directly on the uh, user configuration, but you will go into what we call the policy, right? GPO, the group policy whatsoever. If you go in there, you may be already written a PowerShell script on how to automate just that deployment. So you have maybe new person coming on board on, and a laptop needs to be issued to them. Instead of just me going constantly in there, I have my little script that I will just have it run and that it implements those password parameters, right? What I'm saying is Windows, maybe this is a Windows 10 machine, Microsoft will just release an, over, an update overnight and this will not run. Trust me, it's just sometimes a syntax. Oh, look at it, I'm even talking about it. Jonathan is saying also every time Windows updates run, there could be updates to syntax for PowerShell. That's absolutely true. By the way, we have like four versions of PowerShell. <laughs> so- Understood, yeah. But like um, at least within Azure right now, there is this thing called Azure Blueprints. AWS do not have scripts because AWS is kind of a collection of different things. They don't have their own technology per se especially around virtual machines or whatsoever, like they don't have operating system. It's either Windows services or Linux, right? Um, a lot of things are not like necessarily AWS specific, right? Well, there are Terraform and Ansible, but Ansible is not necessarily, uh, it's not even, Ansible is not an Amazon product, right? Jenkins is also not an Amazon product. Right. I'd like or to talk to you offline about this because I, it <laughs> does concern me what you're saying about PowerShell. I mean, no problem. We can definitely take it offline. But these are all technical implementation things from the blueprint. Listen, Jonathan, Azure is still ahead because like Jenkins, Terraform, Ansible, none of them are Amazon products. Yeah, I know it's a class, but listen, I'm selling. <laughs> you can see CloudWatch, that is an Amazon product. AWS Inspector, that's an Amazon product. But anyway, so yeah, like the custom scripts that I was talking about. SIM tools, we touch upon SIM. I'm not gonna go over it. If you don't know what a SIM is, go back to the previous note. But again, those monitoring capabilities. Splunk is a major one in the market. Uh, within Azure, there is the log analytics. AWS have their CloudWatch. And I believe uh, the other one is it Cloud Logs or whatsoever, I can't remember. But there are other ones. GRC tools. HP ArcSight. Well, it's no longer HP, but it was a product called ArcSight. I see, oh, Jonathan is a Splunk architect. Nice, everybody go to Jonathan if you wanna know more about SIM. I'm actually not a monitoring person. I, in my viewpoint, monitoring is the most annoying thing to do within the RMA because it is the one thing that requires you, especially as a consultant, be constantly connected. If you are a risk professional as a consultant, you walk in, you do it, you get out, get on the next project. If you get yourself into o &M, we call it operations and monitoring, good luck to you. Same thing, every day. Anyway, uh, moving on, GRC tools. If you don't understand GRC, it's fine, we'll touch upon it. But commercial site, RSC Archer is gaining so much traction, especially even within the gov, the gov. Sentinel, Jeremy, I really am not that, I, I'm not, I don't know so much about Sentinel 
in terms of usability, but I'll still tell you it's good. <laughs> but no, seriously, I do not know how the uh, capability Sentinel, Microsoft Sentinel provides. Happy to help you look into it though. But yeah, RSC Archer heavily used on the commercial sector as well as the civilian side. But I can tell you, DOD, they swear by EMAS. Booz Allen built it, great tool, so many improvement points. The intelligence community, they use so much of Exacta, a company called Taylor's built it. You'd, and we are not going to use any of this in the class, just putting it out there. Assessment tools around those auditing. You, like, I love this. I don't know, it's no longer in use, but during my days of implementation and doing stakes, I just love the DISAS capital. It's simple, it's easy to use, but for some reason there are, they haven't been kind of um, really uh, investing in it. There are a lot of tools right now that do a lot of the jobs like Nessus. Um, uh, Nessus does a lot. Um, other Tenable. Tools. Yeah, Tenable Nessus, yeah. There's also the thread guard, a lot of uh, stick scanning and whatsoever. But also Nessus does a good job of vulnerability scanning as well as stick scan. I think that's why, because they're able to really, and honestly, they're gaining traction, right? Um, when you look at the web application side of things, there are tools like Bobsuit. Um, there are other ones, but I'm more conversant within Bobsuit. Oh, um, I don't know ATP. Is ATP a web application tool or infrastructure and network, Jeremy? Uh, it's like Microsoft Windows Defender ATP. Oh! That's ATP the uh... own product. Right. It's fancy. <laughs> right. I know there are so many we are just putting out there and I can't remember all of them. No, but honestly, um, this it's good. for the past decade, I have been a heavy Linux person and AWS centric. And then I joined Microsoft in March and I started drinking the Kool-Aid. I'm not yet, I haven't finished drinking it yet, but trust me when I'm done, like I'm going to be all. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> the Microsoft environment is pretty robust because it can tell you the patching status across the environment. I don't know. I will be honest. Uh, Windows 10 is proven to be okay. The agile environment is really, really coming up ever since we started focusing on customer centric rather than de being developer centric. Because that is one part that I felt like uh, AWS is really beaten um, it, agile around that customer focus, but then when you think of it, like um, Amazon swears on their customers, right? So that customer service, because you go into the AWS portal, it's not as confusing as um, uh, as the Azure. That's absolutely true. AWS has a lot of documentation and even beyond the documentation, they make it such that it's consumable for the consumer, right? Like you can pick the AWS documentation and basically understand it without having so much technical expertise. The Azure one, it's now that we are investing into that. I can tell you one thing though, we have way more services than they do. We have over 300 plus services. All right, I'm done selling. Monitoring tools. Well, SIM can also classify as a monitoring tool, but like within Azure, we have Azure monitors. Can you see like how every place I'm look, putting the Azure tools first? That's because I took the Azure fundamentals. Like, all right, we have a lot of GLC tools. We have the custom tools, okay? Um, don't worry. Uh, can everybody please go on mute? Unless you're specifically talking to me. Um, the, that's it for at least two. This is nowhere an exhaustive list. There are so many tools. The market is now booming. When I say booming, like it's just growing and growing and growing. And there are so many, so many, so many tools. People are specializing. Like um, Jonathan just mentioned, he's uh, he's a Splunk architect. I absolutely love Splunk. It's an amazing tool. Like it's really an amazing tool. The only thing I didn't like it is when I was looking into it, it's very agent focused, not necessarily integration specifically. The integration is dependent upon agents. So unless you're, oh, nice. 50% architects, 50% ISSM. That's good, Jonathan, really cool. Yeah, um, so Jonathan will be on that technical side and whatsoever as well um, of Splunk. I'm not conversant, but if you want like Splunk lately, there is a high demand by the way. 
a very, very high demand market for Splunk experts. Just like there is high for like AWS, Azure certifications or whatsoever, Splunk is basically dominating the government entirely, including the DOD. They are just swallowing everything around SIM. But the absolute truth is good. It is good. The dash button could be, could be better, but it's been a while since I use it. So I know Tableau for dashboard and it's really good. So you can connect the two. One thing I like about all of these tools in all honesty is they are not following around the early technology methodology of like how Cisco used to be a pain for you to use a Cisco device. You need a Cisco switch. You need to use this specific pod that is a proprietary pod for Cisco. No, almost all of the tools here they really connect with each other very well. Like the connection between Tableau and ServiceNow and ServiceNow and Splunk and whatsoever, it's really amazing. So I like the fact that the entire industry is focusing more on providing added value to the consumer, not necessarily locking you into their own tool. I can say that um, that's a really great thing. All right, so what does the... I want to confirm what you said about the Splunk and Archer and all that stuff. If you go back kindly to the previous slide, mm -hmm. so all agencies with the .gov, you know, mm -hmm. with the accepted EOD, um, they are supervised by the DHS and they use the RSA Archer for the executive dashboard. So basically they have like three different layers, the layer A, B, C, and D. So layer A and B, they use Splunk for integration for all those agencies tools. And when it comes to the agency executive dashboards for, for the senior officials of each agency, they go with the RSA Archer and Tableau. So Supplant pull the data from the layer A and push it to layer C and D through RSA Archer and Tableau so they can see those. And on layer A, they use the Nessus. The yep. Tenab Center. Yep, absolutely agree. Like sometimes like, especially like the log, Splunk will take it, or maybe it will go to a data storage and then GRC tool like RSC Archer will take it from here. FYI, I 100% agree with you, by the way. Um, even the DOD sec, but one point of correction, you made a statement that I disagree with where you said all of them are uh, uh, being overseen by DHS, no. I'm sorry, I meant uh, to with the CDM, the continuous diagnosis oh, okay. mitigation. That I 100% agree because 90% of the role that DHS is now playing within the RMF is around tick, the uh, requirements uh, for um, trusted internet connections or maybe trusted, yeah, trusted internet connection, right? Where you have every agency must have a dedicated fiber or maybe their own uh, VPN from the cloud service provider to them without transversing the public internet. That is one thing. And I think even DHS, they are passing that responsibility to CISA. Well, CISA is on that DHS. But I agree with you. <laughs> FYI, I used to be, I used to work with Deloitte, and Deloitte is a managed service provider. So basically putting different types of these tools into one thing and selling it as a single solution, right? So I absolutely have done um, a little bit of that architecture. But yeah, they're really, really like being conversant in some of these tools has so much value. Uh, I'll be honest with you, right now, I don't want to do any of this, but I agree with you. I'm curious what you do, Dr. Ibrahim, so you probably... <laughs> I'm just curious, like, what, what is your role at Microsoft? Or is it from compliance side, consultant, or technical? No, nope. I am a senior manager, so I do a lot of deciding what tools are we going to build. So if you ask me, I'm trying to... Are you marketing up. for one of these on the slide? <laughs> Mm, let's take it offline. <laughs> I can tell you that my work is revolves around uh, these two sectors, the DOD and the Intel. That's what I do, but we can take it offline. Yeah. Absolutely. I would vote for PowerShell for Linux. Non-recorded, please. I'm sorry? I said I would vote for PowerShell for Linux. PowerShell for Linux? Well, here's the thing. We have already embraced having Ubuntu within... Um, within Windows systems. Uh, that's a good one. I actually don't know if PowerShell is supported within, I think you can call Ubuntu, uh, sorry, not Ubuntu. I think you can call Linux uh, Unix systems within PowerShell, 
But I'll be honest with you, I will never use PowerShell for Linux. I will just go to maybe the main powerhouse. I rather just use my Python. Right. With Python, because Python is super powerful. It's applicable everywhere. But then um, very true. PowerShell is just uh, it's just like the Windows updates really really messes up with PowerShell scripts, and it makes sense because they are not for they don't like stakes. This entire dot gov market it's literally like well I wouldn't to throw numbers I would say it's less than three percent of Microsoft Windows global market. Like I think the most remote place if you go and you see a device. If you are to look at what the OS is, I guess you will see Windows. <laughs> it might be an outdated one, but you will see a Windows machine. So the market is beyond that, and not everybody is writing those scripts, right? So, but I agree with you. Um, maybe when we take it offline, I can talk to you about what I do in that sector. All right. Mm -hmm. um, so going back, these are like the tools. When I keep saying, getting your hands dirty. What does that mean? We are going to do this journey, right? You are going to do the planning phase where you identify these. How do you categorize? Identify the inheritable controls, identify all of these nice things, do your own boundary. And the bright side of it, I please, 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 Dave and I will do a very good job of making sure the videos are available. But if you don't know this, please do not spend time trying to capture the notes as I am going through it in class. Rather, just focus on understanding what we are doing and then go back to the videos to kind of do it yourself. I don't plan on having you do full as if it's a dedicated agency. Like when you look at all the artifacts here, the only thing we will just look for are like uh, SSP, I believe, uh, no, a little bit of BIA, not even the ITC, like I have bundled the ITCP and IRP to just that, um, information technology, continuous monitor. No, ISCM, that's what we will have. Uh, I believe we will have a FIPS 199 and that's it. There are other ones that if you are doing it day to day, you already know them. If you don't know them, you will learn them when you get the job related to that, right? But we're not going to touch upon that. I, we are also going to skip the IVMV internal validation because it's kind of the same thing, only that this is from an external entity and this is more from internal, like more due diligence before the assessment. But you, we will do an assessment and you will do that. So you will implement, do the assessment as well. Um, we will definitely build a SAR and a POEM because they are very, very important. They are kind of the guiding decision of whether an environment should be authorized or whatsoever. We are not necessarily going to remediate, but we are going to talk about what remediation is, but we will identify it in the POEM. And I am the AO. This is my best part of the class. You submit a one page authorization document to me and I will go in and sign it if I agree with your system. Or I will say, yep, you are authorized. Bye bye. Or nope, this system is not authorized. But don't worry, no hanging fruits, nothing major. If it's your new thing, if you are new to it, uh, like the implementation part, I'm only going to ask you to take only one control. You can take a simple control as having a screensaver in place or having a banner or having um, a password parameter, just simple, simple implementation. My goal is not to have you spend so much cycle in the unnecessary part, but rather just to take it from the beginning to the end and wear many hats. You are going to be like the ISSO at this level where you're doing the planning. You're also going to be the, I'm sorry, the person who suffers the most that building all of these documentation, that's the risk professional. 95% we call consultants to do that. You are going to build an ATO package and you're also going to wear, again, the heart of an ISSO to see if the ATO package is good to go. But I want the technical implementation. Either use your laptop, either whatsoever, I don't care. Whatever you choose to pick, fine by me, just show it to me. You are going to become a system engineer. So if you are like, no, listen, I'm not gonna do this in this class because I don't know anything technical. I don't even know what you guys are talking about. It's a PowerShell. What I know how to do is to tell you the recipe for cupcakes. I'm sorry. Part of the requirement of the class, you are going to implement. But what you're going to implement, I'm absolutely willing to work with you. If you have never done this, I don't care. Use your iPhone, put a password log for me, 
there is a control around AC and IA that requires you to have passwords in place or lock mechanisms in place, I will accept that. We will identify the list thing that you know how to do and we will do it, but you must implement, meaning you're going to wear the heart of a system engineer or security engineer just for that time. Beyond that, you are also going to wear the heart of an assessor where yes, it is your system, but before you even become the assessor, I still want you as a system engineer to do the most annoying thing ever that is collect an evidence. So I need you either to record or send me screenshots or whatever it is that shows like your system has been implemented, like you have implemented your technical control. Then you are going to be an assessor. And I want you to tell me as an assessor, what is the failure with that implementation that you did? One thing, I'm not looking for you to go and brainstorm on what the problem is. No, 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 no. We are just going to walk through it together, but you, um, the instructions are out there. As we go through it, you will understand. Once all of those are in place, you are going to have that security assessment report for me in place that informs the authorizing official. That's the only thing I'm not gonna let you be. You're not going to be the boss in terms of being the CEO, the CISO or whatsoever. No, I am. I am that in this class. I'm going to wear the hat, sit down on my chair. Actually, I think I'm gonna have you submit your AO and then I'm going to take a one month vacation as if it's like how it is done in the real life, you know? And then it's going to sit there on the desk and collect the dust. No waivers, absolutely no waivers. No, 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 no. This is the fun part. Just kidding, Cleandra. Let's talk and see what you mean by waiver. No, this is not at 5 p.m. on a Friday. No, this is all the activities from that we are going to have through the end of the semester. I'm absolutely not saying you are going to do all of this on one day. Absolutely no. It's what we are going to start. The first ask is just to do planning and categorization. Don't worry. For right now, I don't think there is an ask in the class to do any of this. Nope. We will get on this next week. And uh, the key thing though, I will literally stress it. This is the part where I um, apologize everybody, please, if you have to drop, feel free to drop, but I still need to cover these things. And if you have the time, please just afford me four minutes. Apologies for that. But I will be terrible. Some of you will hate me and I'm just saying it ahead of the time. Ask Dave, he knows this. I'm going to be a real pain to you all. I didn't say I'm not going to be supportive. I'll be available, I'll be reachable. I will support you from end to end, but I'm going to be ridiculously crazy in my requirements and ask if I- So you can be 100% authentic to an actual chief level executive. Exactly. If I, <laughs> if I say that I want you to submit the SSP in a Word document and you submit an Excel, I promise you I'm going to fail you that five points of that activity. You might think I'm being ridiculous. No, ask anybody who has gone through an ATO. There are so many different types of people. And if you come through a difficult assessor, a difficult CISO, a difficult whatsoever, those are the kind of things that will happen and you will not be able to achieve an ATO and you will not get your system to go live. It costs more money. It frustrates everybody. If that is your job and you are not the CISO, affects your bonus, affect whatsoever if you're seeing it from how it impacts you, if you're seeing it from how it impacts the entire system, if it's meant to be a COVID detection system or maybe a COVID whatsoever, you not being careful to pay attention to it has resulted in the system that go in life, has resulted into not having a tool that allows COVID trace whatsoever. I kid you not, I am being that pain not because I want to, but because that is how it is. I promise you, I have had an ATO memo that I drafted when my wife gave birth, before I took my, um, <laughs> when we had our son, before I took my little break, I literally write the one page ATO memo that we are going to submit. Only God knows how I literally mistyped. I don't even know. And I got it tossed back. And because of that, it literally affected us. Spelling, punctuation, to the point that I have seen, especially within DOD, good luck trying to not have maybe 
uh, like, you know, that uh, uh, a place where it's meant to be in italics and you decide to have it normal, good luck, someone will toss it back. If it is meant to be, the text is meant to be literally in block size where it's perfectly aligned. And no, you don't want to because you feel like, yeah, uh, sorry, I'm going to pick on people like me. I'm a millennial. I don't care. I'm going to do it my way. Take it or leave it. Blah, blah, blah. Well, good luck to you. It's coming back. If you decide to give it to them where it's not aligned, you have to follow the instructions. And I kid you not, I will do the same. So start hitting me right now. All right. I'm sorry. I know I'm being too serious, but that's how it is. Question. 